And <clears throat> this is Bill Graben welcoming you all uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors of York County Audubon. We're delighted to have you here tonight for what has become our monthly Zoom program. Uh, and this is not anything we, we planned in years past. Uh, we look forward to the day when we can welcome you again to in-person programs. But until that day arrives, we are, we are grateful to whoever did the coding to create Zoom so that we could bring programs to you, whoever those nameless people are. Tonight, our program is entitled Seabird Sentinels in the Gulf of Maine, what they can tell us about the state of our oceans. And our presenter is Dr. Donald Lyons. And uh, many of you are no doubt quite familiar with the basic outlines of the, how, how seabirds have fared in the Gulf of Maine in the last century. By the middle of the 20th century, many populations of uh, birds, seabird species were really decimated. And in the 1970s, uh, Steve Kress came to Maine, uh, working under the auspices of National Audubon Society. And he had the ambition uh, to restore these populations and their habitat in Maine. And the process was very difficult at first for a number of years, very uh, halted progress, but eventually things got going in a good direction, uh, thanks in large part to a tremendous number of innovative techniques that were developed here in Maine to lure birds to the islands and encourage them to nest and reproduce there. And in fact, some of these techniques have now been used around the world for other threatened seabird populations and it's been a tremendous success and um, a year ago Steve Kress retired and we are so thankful that we have found uh, not not your county Audubon but this program has found a successor to him in Dr. Don Lyons. Don has spent his career working on seabirds uh, around the country around the world and National Audubon and Maine Audubon and York County Audubon are so delighted to have him here to carry on this work. Uh, the threats are certainly as great now as they've ever been. And there's no time to take time off from doing the work that has been, been done here. So at the end of the program, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have questions, during the course of the program, please type them. Please hit the Q&A button at the lower center of your screen and type in your question. And we'll do our best to feed them to Don at the end of this program and give him a crack at them. So without further ado, we're delighted to have Don in Maine and we're delighted to have him here with us tonight. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, for the invitation. It's, it's a great honor uh, to speak to uh, York County Audubon and, and uh, folks with Maine Audubon and, and uh, from far and wide. Um, and thanks, Nick, for all of your help in getting this program going. I'm going to work on sharing my screen. Let's see. And if I've done that right, you all should be looking at a slide with a, a very appealing Atlantic puffin on it. Um, Looks good, Don. Oh, thank you. Uh, so um, as Bill mentioned, I, I envisioned this talk uh, to be focused on uh, how seabirds are, are great sentinels of our ocean environment in the Gulf of Maine. Um, when I was pulling slides together, uh, in the last few days, I actually kind of took a mental step back and wanted to think about um, seabirds more broadly than just the Gulf of Maine. So I'll, I'll start a little more broadly with the talk tonight um, and then uh, bring it back to uh, kind of more local, uh, local challenges and successes here in Maine um, and then open it up for questions. 
I hope I've, I've uh, limited the number of slides so that we'll have a lot of time for questions. That's definitely my intent to have a little more interactive evening than, than just me uh, 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 talking and, and presenting to all of you. But um, so I, and I probably all of us are familiar with uh, the canary in the coal mine uh, story or, or uh, idea where birds uh, are incredible indicators of their environment um, and it, in that way are very useful to us to understand uh, the environment that we also live in um, and the effects on the environment that we may have in a coal mine um, that's a very uh, novel environment but uh, in the marine environment where seabirds live this is still very true of course as well. Um, birds are, of course, um, a great reflection of their environment. Um, and so uh, their, their status, um, their population welfare, their population abundance and trajectory are certainly a result of environmental conditions and, and how we're impacting those environmental conditions. Um, and for seabirds, um, what, what we're noticing or what seabirds are telling us um, is that environmental conditions are changing rapidly and for a large number of seabirds, those changes are not favorable. Um, so over the last 70 years, uh, sorry, over the last, uh, yeah, 70 years or so, um, seabirds have declined upwards of 70% in, in abundance, in numbers. Um, mo and uh, by most categorizations, uh, they're the most threatened group of birds. Um, as many as one third of all seabird species, which can run 400 or so, depending on who's counting, um, are in some way threatened. Um, the tern species, pictured in the upper right on your screen, um, is actually a Chinese crested tern. Um, and it's a species that was actually thought to be extinct for over 60 years um, and is now, it was rediscovered about 20 years ago, um, but only around 100 adults uh, currently are known. Um, so it's a critically endangered species of bird. Um, there's a lot of reasons uh, for those declines, uh, which I'm going to go through. Uh, some of the more significant ones globally here on the next several slides. Um, but climate change, um, which we all know um, is, is a problem for many species of wildlife, um, is certainly a, a challenge for seabirds and a growing challenge, of course. Um, so that really adds to uh, the uh, causes that have driven this decline for so long. Um, the majority of this decline seen is not due to climate change, um, it's due to other factors. One last thought about seabird conservation in general um, is that it, it needs to happen in the marine environment where our conservation efforts are really um, still pretty early on. Um, when you think about uh, for example, our national wildlife refuge system here in the United States or our national park system here in the United States, the majority of those locations, of those parks, of those refuges are set aside on land. Um, we still have not really thought, uh, thought hard about uh, protection of the, a comparable amount or comparable fraction of uh, the water territory of the oceans uh, that exist on the on the earth um, and that that includes both in territorial territorial waters and the open ocean which is um, not under the jurisdiction of any country um, so uh, seabirds exist out in places where there's much less conservation activity than what we're used to um, and even, you know, even though what we're used to on land is often uh, insufficient, uh, seabirds are kind of a, a, in an environment where we're, we're devoting much less conscious thought um, to their conservation. But I wanted to go through some of the causes of decline that uh, have been documented. 
And it, there's been a, a summary paper that was produced just last year, 2019, that uh, went through the major causes of mine for seabirds or the major threats uh, for seabirds now. Um, and uh, th there's three that are particularly acute. Um, this listing had bycatch as maybe slightly greater than the other two, so I'll start with that. Um, but uh, bycatch is generally uh, a mortality cause uh, that results when uh, people fishing um, have gear that can inadvertently uh, entice seabirds into um, uh, an unfortunate demise. This is an albatross that was hooked uh, on a, a long line fishing line. Um, these long line fisheries use uh, lines with thousands of hooks that are mile, and the lines themselves are miles long. Um, bycatch uh, to this fishery and others is not a, a particularly acute issue in the United States. Our fisheries management is generally uh, relatively strong among the, uh, the world, uh, but globally, uh, protections against seabird bycatch in fisheries are much weaker. Um, and so uh, globally, this is a pretty severe problem, particularly for species like albatross that are drawn to fishing vessels, to follow fishing vessels, and are prone to attempting to steal bait off of hooks um, as those lines are fed into the water. So um, a really serious problem globally, one we definitely need to keep our eye on here in the US, um, but probably not as severe a problem for us at, at this time as it is elsewhere in the world. Another problem, uh, which is historically has been the greatest problem for seabirds, um, but is somewhat less severe these days, is the uh, challenge of introduced uh, invasive species on seabird nesting islands. Um, and this, uh, the most common example of this is rats being introduced to islands inadvertently um, by people visiting uh, islands that normally have not had much human traffic. Um, the example I have photographed here uh, and circled in that, that orange circle is actually mice. Um, and this is a mouse on the head of an albatross on Midway Atoll, um, a U.S. managed uh, property in the, the Pacific Ocean, of course famous for the Battle of Midway during World War II, uh, more famous recently for uh, Wisdom, the albatross, the oldest known uh, living wild bird. Um, and that island, unfortunately, is overrun by house mice. Um, and they, uh, they are a new uh, unknown species to albatross. And al many albatross do not have what we would think of as, as normal defense mechanisms against them or even recognize them as a threat. Um, and so they are able to climb onto birds, to chew on adults who are uh, focused on staying on their egg and incubating that egg and will not uh, get up and leave that egg, even though there's a, an annoyance of a mouse chewing on them. Um, and this can eventually cause fatal consequences. Um, it's not a huge problem for albatross at, at Midway because there are uh, multiple millions of laysan and black-footed albatross there. But this problem of mice and albatross happens elsewhere um, at, at islands where uh, albatross populations are very small uh, because of other reasons like bycatch, for example. Um, so uh, the problem of invasive species is one that, that does hit, um, hit us here in the US or in, our, in the lands we manage. Um, and there's been several successful uh, rodent removal programs uh, on seabird islands, but there are still far more many, uh, far more islands to do to, to uh, restore to native fauna um, to allow seabirds to thrive. So a very significant problem for seabirds globally um, and one that in, in particular locations within the US is, is a problem with us as well. 
Of course, another major problem is climate change. Um, and this is a growing problem. So of these three kind of top listed problems, bycatch, invasive species, and climate change, climate change is definitely accelerating the most rapidly um, and uh, appears to be the biggest problem uh, in the future. Um, and uh, of course, one example of the way climate change impacts seabirds it is uh, severe weather events. Uh, for example, um, hurricanes along our Gulf Coast or our Atlantic Coast um, that uh, become much more energetic because they're traveling over very hot energetic water. Um, the, the aerial image or satellite image uh, is of Hurricane Hugo uh, as it was hitting Texas. Um, the two photos on the right on this slide uh, are actually of an island uh, in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, Crab Bank Island. Um, and th this is a location where there was once a very thriving brown pelican colony and along with other seabirds, royal terns, black skimmers, uh, common terns and others. Um, and uh, that island has been hit by numerous uh, energetic storms. Um, and in the lower photo, you can see that um, it, it's little more than a sandbar and uh, some associated wet marsh. Um, and there are a few seabirds clinging to uh, that sandbar uh, that are attempting to nest but are often overwashed. So here's a direct effect of rising sea levels, uh, inundation from those waters, uh, coupled with storm events um, that are made worse by climate change. So um, th this is just one aspect of climate change, but a very serious one um, and a problem for seabirds and a growing problem as we, as we move forward. Uh, another problem that is maybe more historic for us in the United States, but, but still a problem we need to keep our eye on and, and uh, manage carefully is that of overfishing. Um, and I've drawn a couple historical photos of uh, bait fishing activity here in Maine um, for herring uh, and sardine actually. Um, and uh, oftentimes in, in decades past, uh, seabirds and other predators were not really considered when trying to decide how much fish could be harvested or should be harvested. Um, and that's something we're working to change and needs to, needs to be changed um, as uh, predators like seabirds, like marine mammals, uh, in particular uh, whales, such as the northern right whale, which is uh, critically endangered. Um, and so uh, we need to be very mindful of leaving enough food in the ocean for seabirds and other predators. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on this a bit more in the talk as we go on. Um, certainly another problem which appears to be growing, um, or certainly is growing, um, is that of pollution. And that can take a variety of forms. Uh, what I've chosen to uh, give you some imagery for here on this slide is plastic pollution, of course, and I'm, I'm sure everyone is quite aware of that. A graphic example of impacts to seabirds um, is uh, in these two photos. Um, and albatross are one of the more susceptible species to plastic ingestion. They uh, typically do look for uh, prey, such as squid, um, that are at the surface. Uh, plastic, floating plastic debris can confuse them, um, can appear to be food, um, and the adults will ingest that. Um, it typically isn't a huge problem for adults. Um, they can regurgitate it, cough it back up if they need to, um, but uh, adults will come back to a colony after uh, being away for days uh, or even a week or two um, and regurgitate these plastic pieces uh, to their chicks, to feed their chicks. Um, the chicks are often unable to cough this back up, um, and it, that accumulating plastic debris takes up space in their stomach, 
um, and they can consequently starve because they can't ingest any more real food uh, from their parents. Um, so it, it's not an uncommon sight at some of the very large albatross colonies in the Pacific um, to see uh, the carcasses of chicks like this one splayed out. Um, this is also, uh, these photos were also taken at Midway. Um, and the chick, if the stomach has, has ruptured or um, if it's uh, carefully opened, it's quite common to see abundant plastic debris in the stomach. So a very sad problem in this case, um, but uh, one that is, is a real challenge to deal with as well and probably growing. Um, a, a challenge that's hopefully not growing <laughs> um, is that of direct hunt, hunting of seabirds. Um, it still happens in a few places in the world. Uh, the top center photo here is showing a puffin harvest in Iceland, um, and there is still limited harvest there. Um, probably not very consequential harvest. Um, kind of the poster child for uh, overhunting um, is the great auk. Um, and I have John James Audubon's print of the great auk there in the, the lower uh, center portion of the slide. Um, we do have an example uh, that does hit as close to home, even if it is historical. Um, that's, of course, the use of birds in the millinery trade uh, in the late 1800s. Um, that basically, uh, feathers or even entire bird carcasses uh, were used to adorn women's hats. Um, and that's, of course, uh, one of the primary challenges that many Audubon societies were first formed to, uh, to fight, to, to resolve or, or address. Um, and with the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act early in the 20th century, um, significant progress was made on that front. So uh, in the US, hunting is not a very severe problem. Um, there's a couple of issues with species that migrate uh, to other places and can be harvested there, um, but not something that seems to be um, too pressing here for us in the US. Um, but there is another challenge, which uh, does uh, certainly um, occur in the United States. Uh, and that's subsidized native species. And kind of the poster child for that is the various species of gulls we have along all of our coastlines. Uh, gulls, of course, are incredibly smart birds, uh, very adaptive, um, and very able to uh, observe both other gulls and other species, such as ourselves, uh, and identify food resources um, and identify uh, human uh, provided food sources, uh, such as uh, in the top photo there, um, a, a, an open landfill. That's certainly been a, a factor in growth of, in the growth that was seen in gull populations during the 20th century. Uh, and uh, those large numbers of gulls that resulted from having very abundant food uh, largely took over many traditional seabird islands, uh, many islands that often supported more rare uh, species. Um, this this uh, large central photo is a photo of Eastern Egg Rock um, in the, uh, let's see, this would have been the, the 1970s when it was largely dominated by gulls um, and there were no puffins, there were no terns nesting there. Um, so uh, definitely uh, a, a challenge, uh, one that, that is under our control uh, to a large degree um, if we can choose to manage um, the food resources that we make available to these species. So seabirds face a, a large number of challenges. Um, I wanted to kind of work through that just, just as context for our situation here in Maine and in the Northeast. Um, and, uh, but I also want to contrast those challenges with some successes. Um, and I, I hope that by the end of the talk, I leave you with uh, the understanding, um, the belief 
that people can make a difference. Um, and I'll, I'll start right off by pointing out a couple people who have. Um, I'll start with William Dutcher. Um, many of you may not know uh, that he was a co-founder of the National Audubon Society, uh, which started out as um, a New York-based organization, but um, he was also very prominent in the American Ornithological Union. Um, and under his uh, uh, direction, one of the first conservation activities for birds one of the first conservation activities that an Audubon Society uh, put forth uh, was right here in Maine uh, at Matinicus Rock. Uh, William Dutcher saw that uh, saw to it that a uh, bird warden was stationed at Matinicus Rock during the summer um, to help protect nesting seabirds there from uh, would-be hunters. Um, and maybe even the, coast, the uh, uh, lighthouse operators, um, uh, caretakers. Uh, but this was you know, one of the first examples of uh, seabird conservation in the country um, and conservation overall for birds. Um, so definitely you know, someone who uh, was a trailblazer uh, in, in that regard. Uh, of course, uh, as Bill mentioned earlier, uh, another uh, notable <laughs> bird conservationist here in Maine is Steve Kress, uh, who founded Project Puffin, the program that I now lead, um, and of course uh, is a, a hero for bringing back puffins to Maine. Um, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that, um, but I, I, I'm guessing most of the audience is familiar with this story, so I'll, I'll probably not uh, devote too much time to it. Um, but definitely, uh, I'm very fortunate to follow in Steve's footsteps um, and, and kind of build on the successes that, that he had. And uh, this slide shows some of the techniques that Steve developed uh, to bring puffins back and uh, puffins and other seabirds uh, back to Maine. Um, there was both translocation, the, the photo in the upper left here, or the center of the slide, um, is uh, puffins uh, that have been translocated from a colony in Canada, in Newfoundland, uh, to Maine, uh, where they were uh, hand reared uh, until they were of fledging age and left the island on their own accord um, to their own devices uh, for the rest of their lives. <laughs> uh, eventually, some of those puffins came back to Eastern Egg Rock first and Seal Island later. Um, and uh, and decoys and mirrors were used to give the puffins uh, a sense that they were in the right place, uh, that they were surrounded by other puffins, um, and that it was a, a good place to settle down and start a family. Um, the same techniques uh, became used, or Steve applied those techniques to turns, um, not the translocations as much as just the social attraction, the use of decoys to attract birds, um, and then it's, it, it's been learned uh, over the years since that adding recorded calls uh, is incredibly powerful and very helpful to attract species to a site. Um, the visual stimulus of decoys certainly draws birds in, uh, but if there isn't uh, additional stimulus like sound, um, the birds very quickly um, uh, recognize that the decoys are not real. Um, and, and lose interest in the site when there's, there's no interaction. Uh, sound plays a, a very important role um, in maintaining their, their interest and belief in the site. Um, so with these techniques, um, puffins and terns were uh, restored to Maine, most famously, uh, but a number of other projects have happened across the world, which I'll, I'll touch on in a little bit later slide. Um, but I, I wanted to point out that uh, just attracting the birds back to islands here in Maine hasn't been enough to keep them here and to help them be successful uh, and their populations to grow. There are a number of challenges. <laughs> there are a few um, problematic native species of predators. Um, and this slide shows uh, three types of aerial predators. 
of course, peregrine falcons, uh, one there over a turn, uh, bald eagles, which are particularly effective uh, seabird predators, um, even on some of the larger seabirds like these cormorants, and great horned owls as well. Um, it, it, great horned owls can very easily cause a colony of birds to abandon at night um, and, and lead to the colony abandoning in effect for, for a year. So um, these species are managed. Um, it, in the case of falcons and eagles, uh, we have people living on seabird islands and their presence alone acts as a deterrent. Um, in the case of owls, um, they often need to be captured and relocated um, to address their, their impacts. Um, there are also mammalian predators, uh, mink, otter, seals, others, um, that can be a problem for uh, seabirds. Mink are particularly troublesome as they'll come on to a colony uh, and um, cause a, a high rate of mortality and, and nighttime abandonment again. Um, so uh, predators are, are a significant challenge wherever restoration happens um, and need to be considered. Uh, we either need to be uh, very smart. The best solution here is to pick sites where these predators are not present or can't access. Um, uh, but having some, some alternative plans, such as being able to station people on the island to deter predators it is usually a necessary part of any restoration project. There's also the issue of vegetation. Uh, so um, vegetation growth, particularly invasive exotic vegetation, um, it is an ongoing challenge on seabird islands here in Maine. Um, and likely, uh, well, it really is, uh, in a large number of locations around the world. Um, this, this turn is trying to find uh, a chick. Um, it's carrying a fish and, and trying to find its chick to feed. Um, and you can see how difficult that is in this, this very tall, dense vegetation. Certainly the vegetation problem is exacerbated um, in coastal Maine um, by climate change. Uh, we typically experience more rain um, in, in warm years. Um, certainly this year was an exception as Maine uh, is in something of a drought, but um, vegetation also benefits from the presence of the birds. Uh, the bird's guano acts as a natural fertilizer. Um, so uh, there's a bit of a positive feedback loop here that we have to overcome to keep ideal habitat available for birds. That ideal habitat is a mix of bare bare ground uh, or bare rock in Maine's case um, and vegetation. Uh, kind of the, the picture in the lower left is an ideal scenario about half and half of each. Um, and ways to maintain that include um, fairly robust, resilient ground cover. Um, and that can be made out of vari a variety of materials. We're actually moving towards a uh, very tightly woven hemp mat, uh, which is terrific because it, um, it you know, naturally biodegrades over time. So uh, we're making some progress on identifying uh, good materials uh, that are compatible with the environment. And sometimes we supplement um, the, the mix of vegetation and bare substrate with uh, nest structures, boxes, um, and uh, roseate terns in particular like to have some cover, um, overhead cover, and these uh, boxes provide uh, shelters uh, that they, they favor um, and uh, helps them uh, avoid predators, helps the chick uh, stay out of sight of predators. Um, so uh, another way in which we enhance habitat for birds here in Maine. Uh, another way that we maintain habitat uh, in good quality is uh, the removal of uh, marine debris. Um, and in Maine, of course, uh, the, the most prolific type of fishing is lobster fishing. Uh, and uh, the, the gear associated with that 
uh, is sometimes lost. Uh, and uh, then during winter storms uh, is sometimes thrown up on islands, on beaches. Uh, most people have probably seen this um, in various coastal areas of Maine. It's a pretty common occurrence. Um, and it can create hazards for birds nesting on islands, um, can get tangled in a, in a derelict trap or um, uh, on a, a line. Um, and so uh, we do regular cleanup activities, um, often in partnership with uh, lobstermen. This is actually a joint project. This particular photo is a joint project at Stratton Island that we undertake with uh, the Maine uh, Lobster Foundation. So um, just, just an important part of maintaining a, a good environment for seabirds in Maine. And I wanted to show uh, signs of success. Um, certainly most people are probably familiar with these curves that go uh, up and to the right. <laughs> um, these are two of the main uh, success stories of Project Puffin. Uh, the orange line and the scale on the right is the number of Atlantic Puffin burrows at Eastern Egg Rock where it all started. Um, and they continue to grow. More puffins are there about every year. Um, and then uh, uh, on the left in the blue line uh, is the uh, number of common turned nests or breeding pairs um, that we have across the Seven Island Audubon Sanctuary Network here in Maine. Um, and that as well um, has been a huge success story uh, and, and is growing and we, we hope to overtake 10,000 pairs um, across our sanctuary network here sometime soon. Okay. So when you take action and uh, commit uh, to effort on the behalf of seabirds, um, there's uh, really good things possible, um, but it does take concerted, dedicated effort. And those efforts can spread across the country and the world. Um, one, uh, one way we're beginning to help other projects around the world is uh, we've taken on the manufacturing of decoys for social attraction efforts. Um, and this is Sue Schubel, who's been with Project Puffin for a number of years. Um, and she's uh, a, uh, a dedicated artist and produces amazingly lifelike uh, uh, terns and, and other species, some gannets there in the lower right. Um, and these decoys and sound systems are, are really important to projects that are happening around the world. Um, this map shows uh, a newly tabulated list of seabird restoration <laughs> projects around the world. Uh, we actually are partnering with uh, several other partners from as far away as New Zealand um, to tally all of the restoration projects and uh, kind of learn uh, as many lessons from, from all of these projects as we can. Uh, it, it's an amazing accomplishment now that that these techniques have been used to help restore uh, at least 94 species of seabirds around the world. That's nearly, a, it's more than a quarter of all the seabirds in the world, um, approaching a third uh, by some tallies. Um, and uh, between uh, the different locations and species and projects, um, there's been almost 400 efforts that we've documented and there are surely more that we haven't heard about yet. Um, so we're, you know, we're excited to see these methods uh, spread far and wide and uh, it, it's an amazing testament to the work that's happened here in Maine um, and the, the power of this intentional conservation action. So with that um, kind of background, I, I want to touch on next um, kind of the emerging challenges that we're seeing here in the Gulf of Maine um, and uh, that are really present everywhere uh, across the world. Um, but I'll speak to our, our, our local challenges um, and, and let them serve as an example of, of issues other people are tackling elsewhere. 
So here in the Gulf of Maine, of course, we have a, a relatively large marine ecosystem that we share with Canada. Um, it, it's fed by a watershed that's a pretty good size, um, uh, mostly consists of the state of Maine, but also uh, several other states and provinces. Um, so uh, all of us living on land have some influence over the Gulf of Maine. A everything that uh, that we're doing here in Maine and New Hampshire and New Brunswick and elsewhere um, eventually flows into the Gulf. And so uh, we, we need to be mindful of what we do here because it, it, it is consequential to the Gulf. Um, and the Gulf, it, 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 things even farther afield are very consequential to the Gulf. Um, the Gulf has traditionally been one of the coldest water areas of the ocean at its latitude. And that's primarily because the Labrador Current coming down from Canada, um, on the map here on the left, these black lines that are coming down from uh, Labrador uh, around Newfoundland and um, uh, down our way here in the Gulf um, are bringing very cold water um, with uh, very high quality uh, plankton with them. Uh, and that had a significant influence on uh, the water that, that was present in the Gulf of Maine. Um, kept it cool, particularly at the surface. Um, the other uh, major factor that, that regulates the Gulf of Maine is uh, the Atlantic Gulf Stream, which of course comes up from the south before heading east towards Europe. Hey, hey, Don. I'm gonna, Don. I'm gonna cut you off there for a second. Your audio um, is uh, going crazy a little bit. I don't know if there's a different mic you could use or not. It it uh, happened once before and resolved itself. But me, I'm gonna unmute you and see how that goes. Can you try again? Okay. How is that sounding now? It sounds great now. I'll. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'll, if it happens again, I'll, I'll jump in again and and uh, give it a minute to reset itself. Okay, well, I'm very sorry about the audio challenge. Um, no problem. I'm quite happens. sure what. But, okay, well, um, as I was saying, uh, the Gulf of Maine is really a mix of waters uh, from uh, the Labrador Current from the north and the Gulf Stream from the south. And as we move forward, um, we're seeing a, a much greater. Uh, contribution from the Gulf Stream to the south, uh, in part because the Gulf Stream itself is moving northward. Um, this graph in the upper right is just a uh, fancy way of showing the northward position of the Gulf, um, and you don't really need to pay attention to the anomaly and, and those numbers, uh, but the trend, uh, that tr orange trend line there, is just indicating that the Gulf Stream is moving north uh, more and more um, in association with climate change. Um, and so uh, more Gulf Stream water is flowing into the Gulf of Maine and less, uh, less Labrador current uh, water. And that's warming the Gulf of Maine um, very rapidly, um, even more rapidly than one would predict by uh, the result of climate change alone. This figure, um, the blue line here, I'll start there, shows kind of the global average ocean temperature. Um, and it's certainly increasing um, over this time period, uh, you can see. Um, the red line is showing the Gulf of Maine uh, surface ocean temperature. Um, and you can see that uh, particularly in the last decade, um, the Gulf of Maine has warmed at a much higher rate than the global ocean average. Um, and again, that's because of this change in current flows into the Gulf with much more water coming from the south um, than historically occurred. The map here in the upper left, you can see um, the, the fastest warming places are shown in red. Um, and you can see that here uh, in Maine and elsewhere along the Northeast US and, and uh, Southern Canada, are among the, the warmest, the hottest colors and, and the fastest warming areas. Okay, 
And of course, if the water is changing, that's changing the environment for all of the animals in that water. Um, and particularly for seabirds, that's changing the environment for fish. Um, and fish are certainly changing their distributions to reflect those changes in water temperature. The two figures on the left here are just showing um, that fish are moving, uh, are more commonly encountered in uh, the Northeast. Um, their, their distributions are shifting um, and they're more commonly encountered in deeper water. Um, and both of those effects uh, are keeping fish in the temperature conditions that they want to be in. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's something that seabirds have to consider because they want to catch some of those fish and oftentimes they want to catch particular species. Um, white hake, uh, a map, a distribution map for white hake uh, is shown on the right. White hake is actually a, a very good fish for puffins and other seabirds. Um, that puffin pictured is holding several white hake uh, in its bill to take the feed to its chicks. Um, and the color coding on that map show areas where um, that uh, white hake are being encountered or, or cat, uh, caught in, in research surveys, uh, less in blue and more in red. And you can see that, that white hake are becoming more common or more abundant in most of the Gulf, but in that blue circled area, uh, which is right along our main coast, um, there's also some blue there there, indicating that fewer white hake are being encountered there. Um, unfortunately, in that blue area, that's the, the coast where our, our seabird nesting islands are. Um, and so in areas close to uh, seabird colonies, white hake is actually in decline. Um, and so we're concerned that uh, white hake, that puffins and other nesting seabirds may have to go farther uh, to get good fish uh, as one outcome of climate change. Um, and we're working hard to understand that, document it, um, and um, if it is occurring, um, figure out what we can do to help seabirds overcome that challenge. Um, with climate change, we are seeing some diet changes. Um, and I, I won't go into this in too much detail, um, but Probably the most interesting uh, change uh, is butterfish, which are in the middle. You can see that uh, butterfish were a small part of the diet um, in all of the years of this comparative study, uh, but a bit more abundant in uh, the more recent years, the warmer years, shown in red here. And the three bars just represent three different colonies in Maine, three different islands. Um, but just a small difference in butterfish, uh, but a meaningful one, as I'll show in uh, this slide and next. So butterfish are, are the very large fish uh, that the adult puffin in the left photo is, show, is uh, holding. Um, it, not really a problem for an adult to consume, um, and it's a generally good, good high energy content fish. Uh, but you can see uh, the chick holding that but or holding a butterfish on the right um it, it's likely going to have a really hard time swallowing that fish and that is what happens uh, we find uh often many butterfish scattered around a burrow um that the chick uh, has attempted to eat um but is unable to um, and so that's a real problem that that represents um a, a dearth of nutrition for the chick labor by the adult um, that, that goes to naught. Um, and, and so it poses a real problem for puffins, terns as well. Um, and so we're, we're not clear why the adults don't identify that the chicks are, are unable to consume them, um, but they uh, are not able to do that. Uh, so it poses a problem. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, Butterfish are a pretty small part of the diet. Um, so one might think it's not that, that significant of a problem, but unfortunately, puff, uh, butterfish are a, a good signal 
that other fish are less present or harder to get. Um, when we start seeing butterfish in the diet, um, we stop seeing other uh, better quality fish. Um, and so uh, even if butterfish are not present in the diet very often, when they are, it represents a, a time when conditions are pretty rough, pretty challenging. Um, and, and this just shows that it, it's, it, it can be quite different between warm years, uh, which is this, this period from 2009 to 2012 and other years, um, but it's still a pretty small part of the diet. It doesn't even get to be more than 10% of the fish that adults are bringing back. Okay, uh, another significant impact we see uh, uh, when we get, when we experience marine heat waves um, it, is that the, just the overall rate of adults bringing fish back to chicks uh, drops a lot. Um, in this figure, uh, I'm showing in these blue bars how many times a chick, a puffin chick, um, this chick was actually uh, watched on a webcam uh, that we serve up, uh, but how many times that chick was fed each day. And you can see uh, in, in early July, late June, it was typically getting four to six or four to eight feedings per day. Um, and the temperature here in orange was relatively moderate. Um, but uh, that summer we experienced two significant spikes in heat um, in late July and early August. Um, and the scale on this figure is in centigrade, but um, the uh, Fahrenheit temperatures of, uh, at, at the sea surface um, got up to uh, close to 70 degrees C or 70 degrees F, which is really warm for the Gulf of Maine. Um, and you can see that the number of times a day this chick was fed really dropped and stayed low. And it, it, it stayed low until those temperatures came back down, in which time the parents could recover and they fed the chicks a lot more. Um, and the chick went from uh, looking pretty bedraggled, and we were worried about this, this particular chick, uh, uh, to a, a pretty healthy looking, normal looking uh, fledgling. So in this case, uh, this particular pair of adult puffins were heroes, um, and they did a really nice job of recovering and raising their chick. Not all parents uh, were able to figure it out um, or were able to work hard enough to do that and many chicks starved uh, during this heat wave. Um, so uh, we're definitely seeing significant uh, challenges, um, both in what types of fish are available and just how much, how many fish are available or can be caught and brought back for puffins and other seabirds to raise their chicks. Okay. So we're working on some new studies, um, one of which is to track puffins while they're raising chicks. Um, we just started this work and we have a little pilot data, um, but we're, we're looking to do more in the next couple of years. Um, and uh, you can see this, this puffin was tagged at Matinicus Rock, um, what, uh, the island I mentioned earlier um, in Penobscot Bay or outside of Penobscot Bay. And the tracks are uh, up to about 30 kilometers away from the colony. Um, so we know that puffins have some limits as to how far they can go um, to, to find prey. Um, so if fish move too far away, we know that puffins are going to experience problems. Okay. Um, one, I'll just touch on a couple things before wrapping up. Uh, and one important uh, part of our work that we're making um, uh, progress on in, in the last couple of years is really sharing our data with fisheries managers in ways we haven't previously. Um, we're starting to contribute to a uh, annual report um, that evaluates the state of the Gulf of Maine ecosystem. Um, and that's information that fisheries managers can use to help them uh, set catch limits and, and 
otherwise determine how uh, how how best to manage uh, the the fish that we've uh, that we fish for here in the Gulf. Okay. Um, I, I want to touch on a couple other important aspects of our program that also are uplifting uh, to kind of wrap up the evening with. Um, and that's really our efforts to recruit new conservationists. Um, we do that, of course, just through our research and monitoring and stewardship efforts across our sanctuary network. We have up to 25 or 30 uh, young seasonal biologists working with us every summer. Um, we also uh, conduct a lot of outreach to the public. Um, and that can be uh, by presenting uh, or in, uh, acting as interpreters on local, local tour boats that are going out to Sea Puffin Islands. That can be uh, through classes we hold at the Hog Island Audubon Camp. Um, in Bremen, Maine, um, but also it can be through talks, <laughs> such as the one I'm giving tonight. Um, and I, I want to leave you with a little bit of a to-do list. Um, it's on our list. Um, I hope it, you might add it to your to-do list. Um, and uh, a couple things that we're working on or that we uh, are going to keep working on um, one is to help defend the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts National Marine Monument. Um, that is some protections for that monument were recently lifted um, by the, the current administration. Uh, we hope those protections can be restored in the future. Um, we're working to call for ecosystem-based fisheries management, uh, both with new laws uh, and regulations that set harvest. Um, and then, uh, of course, something we all can do for seabirds and uh, every species of wildlife is to advocate for action on climate change. Um, we really uh, uh, cannot do enough uh, uh, on, on climate change. And, and, and whatever we can accomplish there has such profound impact uh, that that's that's always an important action to be considering. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I, thank, I wanna thank everyone for your attention. I'm really sorry about the audio qualities that I guess we experienced. Um, and uh, I'm happy and would love to take questions uh, if we can do that now. All right, great job. It was just a brief, a couple of brief moments of audio all set when we recovered, we recovered great. Okay, um, good, good. I'll let Bill uh, handle the questions that I just want to shout out. Please, if you have questions for Don, put them in the Q&A uh, little speech bubble thing down at the bottom, and we will get to them as soon as we can. Well, Don, if you could start with, uh, what are the species, uh, bird species in the Gulf of Maine that you are particularly focused on? Well, certainly Atlantic puffins, of course. Um, it were the original impetus for our program. Um, and that maintains a strong focus. Uh, but uh, the other alcids that we have, razorbills, uh, black guillemots are also uh, uh, species we track carefully. Um, the four species of terns uh, that we have in Maine, those are uh, roseate terns, which are federally listed as endangered, uh, lease terns, which are state listed as endangered, uh, and common terns and arctic terns. Um, we also have uh, a few novel species uh, spread across our islands. Uh, Matinica's rock, for example, has Manx shearwaters, a small number, uh, a half a dozen active nests or so, which is a really fun novelty. The majority of Manx shearwaters nest in Europe, uh, not North America. Uh, we've also, in the last couple of years, had common murres nesting on Matinicus Rock, which was the last kind of member of the seabird community to return to Maine. Uh, there was a long social attraction effort that finally paid off um, with common murres nesting again in Maine. So that, those are our primary uh, focal species, but uh, certainly there are others that, that we're interested in as well. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dave Doubleday and Kenny Buck asking if you could explain how a puffin catches multiple fish in its bill. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I've heard uh, a record uh, the number of fish a puffin can hold in its bill or has been observed to hold of over 60 uh, fish in the bill. It's really pretty amazing. Um, and you think about a puffin is swimming underwater to catch fish um, and so has to grab a fish. Um, and then what they actually do is they can hold uh, fish they've already captured against their upper bill using their tongue um, and still open their lower mandible um, and, and uh, grab yet more um, and then slip their tongue underneath that. So it, it's a pretty uh, impressive feat uh, and really impressive um, for them to do, you know, ten, tens of fish at times. Thank you. We have a, a question from eight-year-old Summer in Kennebunkport who says, uh, thank you for this great talk. What is your favorite seabird species and why? Mm, that is such a hard question. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, um, I have worked with terns more than any other group of birds. So I, I think I would probably have to say a tern. Um, as far as which tern, that's really hard. Um, probably a species that is not very common on our coast, and we don't even have any nesting on our islands. But I, I guess my initial work with seabirds was on Caspian terns, and they're probably still my favorite. <laughs> it's a great one. Uh, I, I have a question uh, too. I do want to say some folks are raising their hand in the chat, Tim and Jackie. If you want to go ahead and try to type your questions into the QA box at the bottom, that's how we can uh, get those question answers. We, we're, we're not doing audio call on, so please put them in there. I see some more people raising their hand. Please put your questions in the chat. Um, my question is about bald eagles. Um, I've heard from a number of scientists that the, the um, increase in bald eagle populations over the past several decades uh, is uh, is playing out in different ways on other bird species. I've talked to scientists in British Columbia who talk about um, harlequin duck um, molt cycles and um, a lot of folks in Maine see increased loon chick predation. Um, I wanted to ask you what else you're seeing uh, with, with more bald eagles being uh, on the landscape uh, on the islands. Yeah, so it, in Maine, the most significant impact of bald eagles currently um, is probably on great cormorants. Um, Maine has always had a very small population of great cormorants, or it, it's never been large. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's been, it's been very small, but um, there have been uh, half a dozen or so uh, small colonies of great cormorants in Maine here at the southern end of the distribution in North America. And um, those small cormorant colonies are susceptible to, dis very susceptible to disturbance. An eagle can land in the colony, you know, maybe it kills one or two cormorants, uh, but the rest of them will abandon. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll even abandon eggs or chicks and, and just not come back. Um, and so we actually only have one consistent great cormorant colony left in, in Maine at wow. Seal Island, which is a national wildlife refuge where we staff uh, seasonal researchers. And those researchers start early in the season, the beginning of May, um, and they are actually still out there right now. Uh, we still have people out there uh, waiting for uh, those cormorant chicks to fledge. Um, and so just by our presence, we kind of deter eagles from uh, perhaps disturbing and ending that last great cormorant colony. So that's how that's playing out here. Um, certainly uh, on the West Coast, common murres are hugely impacted mm. um, and are really shifting their distribution southward um, and 
uh, shifting from kind of the top of large flat rocks to more cliff nesting mm -hmm. habitat and that. So um, eagles have a huge Im impact. Um, we kind of, our, our memory is short. Um, we, we kind of have a baseline uh, of levels of seabirds and other species uh, that started when eagles were much more absent from the environment because of DDT or persecution or other reasons. Um, and now that eagles are returning to the scene, they're definitely changing things up from what we thought was normal. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about piping plovers in Maine. I don't know if that's, uh, you have that information, how they're doing I this. Not, uh, I, I'm, I'm not intimate with piping plovers I, and I don't have data, but uh, depending on the question. Well, I, it, can, I can actually, um, I, I have that, that as well. Nick. You, okay, you go it? ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, yeah I, I got a report from Laura Zitsky at Maine Audubon, who was overseeing the program. And uh, Maine uh, beaches hosted a record high of 98 nesting pairs in 2020 and fledged a record 199 chicks. So that's uh, the resulting productivity of just over two chicks per pair is well beyond the stated 1.5 recovery goal. So a good report. Um, Don, a great question here from, oops, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, great question here from Christy. She asks about um, ways to help canyons and seamounts National Marine Monument. Um, uh, first of all, maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of that area. And um, she also asks, are there any concerns um, environmentally with that area in terms of uh, it warming or um, this, anything similar to the changes you mentioned in the Gulf? Right. Yeah, the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts National Marine Monument was an area set aside during the uh, Obama administration, towards the end of his uh, administration. Uh, and it, in part, it was set aside because it's a winter home for several of our, or many of our uh, puffins here in Maine. Uh, we've done some tracking work for the program here and uh, multiple individuals were tracked spending time in that area of the ocean, uh, which is a couple hundred miles uh, or a bit closer off of Cape Cod. Uh, and uh, so it, it's both important for seabirds, but it's also an incredibly diverse environment, um, particularly on the sea floor, um, but a very productive environment for fish as well. Um, President Trump recently uh, lifted the restrictions on commercial fishing in that environment uh, or in that monument. Um, and so it, it's now, it, preparations are underway to allow uh, commercial fishing again in that space, um, which will uh, uh, potentially deplete uh, what's available there, both for seabirds and other species. Um, and so we're, we're hopeful that that can change um, there's a variety of ways to try and produce that change or suggest that change, um, but uh, primarily political advocacy uh, would be the way, for example, writing uh, members of Congress and letting them know your, your opinion and, you know, encouraging them to, to uh, support uh, restoring those protections uh, could certainly be done legislatively, um, if possible. Um, there is also a lawsuit um, that has been initiated um, and uh, support for the organizations uh, following forward with that um, it, it would certainly be good, um, but probably political pressure is the, the most direct way that, that we as citizens can do that. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have a question as to whether there may be any volunteer opportunities, uh, in, in particular for non-biologists, uh, to support any of the seabird work uh, during the summer. Right. Yeah, so we engage with volunteers and seasonal staff in a variety of ways. 
um, both on our Seabird Islands and at our Hog Island camp. Um, and probably the best way to uh, learn about the uh, Seabird opportunities is to go to projectpuffin.audubon.org, that website. Um, and if you look through the menu there, um, there is uh, a description of the different types of ways we, we uh, get help from folks. Um, so that, that's probably the best way. Um, I will say that uh, COVID uh, has changed how we interact with volunteers. Um, and the, the information on the website certainly does not reflect the COVID reality. Um, yeah. So, uh, but uh, checking there to start, um, and then for people who are interested, kind of getting in touch uh, with us um, over the winter, uh, preferably no later than January when we start making decisions about staffing for the upcoming summer. Thank you. And one final question. Uh, are there webcams on any of the islands? And what's the best way for people to uh, know how things are going on the islands? Are there right. periodic reports? Yeah, um, there are webcams on the on Seal Island primarily, um, and those webcams are delivered through Explore.org. Um, if you go to Explore's website and search for Audubon or Audubon Puffin. Um, that that would get you there. Um, we also have an Osprey webcam at the Hog Island camp, um, and you can also see that on explore.org. Um, in terms of updates, um, we do publish an annual report on, on our progress, um, and we share that with all of our supporters um, and anyone who gets in contact with us. Um, we also post that on our website um, as a digital file for anybody to download. Um, so that's kind of a season summary. Um, and then for uh, people who support the program, we, we offer more uh, frequent updates during the course of the season. Um, and so again, uh, probably going to the website and um, uh, getting in touch with us that way would, would be the best to get on a mailing list for those kinds of updates. Great. Well, thank you, Don, so much for being with us here tonight. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, we wish you all the best, of course, with all your work in Maine. Uh, thanks to Nick and Maine Audubon for hosting. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, our next program is planned for October 20th with uh, Greg LeClaire from the University of Maine uh, giving us a program on reptiles and amphibians. And so again, thank you everyone for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. And this website, a recording of it, of this program will be available on our website, yourcountyaudubon.org. Thank you and good night. Thanks all. It was a pleasure.